Hi everyone, my name is Kara Shixness and I am a summer Wrigley Fellow, um, but I'm also going into my third year back at the Hutchins Lab at USC. So this short talk will focus a bit on what I've been working on this summer at Wrigley. So broadly, I'm answering this broad question of how will climate change affect California's marine primary producers and specifically looking at the response of phytoplankton communities to warming and nutrient limitation. So not to start off with such a doomsday photo, but the theme of my research throughout my dissertation has been about climate change. And it seems like a really relevant time right now with all these crazy uptick in natural disasters and the IPCC just came out with its last report. So yeah, it just seems like things are getting more and more dire, unfortunately. Um, but what maybe some like non-marine people don't think about all the time is the role that the ocean plays in regulating the Earth's climate. So just very simply made this diagram that just shows that the ocean and the atmosphere are always kind of in this relationship, this feedback situation. So, um, and the ocean has helped to kind of regulate and buffer a lot of what we've put into the atmosphere. So for example, the oceans absorb a lot of heat um, due to their high heat capacity, which just means that the water can hold a lot of heat per unit volume. That's why if you live near the water, you'll see like more stable temperatures throughout the year. And then also thanks to the phytoplankton that live in the ocean, the oceans have been able to uptake a lot of this anthropogenic carbon dioxide that we've put into the atmosphere. And through biogeochemical cycling, like carbon cycling can sequester that carbon away at depth and it won't be, it won't come up back into the atmosphere for a while. Um, so the big question mark is what happens if we kind of increase this input of heat and greenhouse gases into the ocean? And uh, by studying the phytoplankton, which seem like such a small part of the whole world, um, by studying just the phytoplankton, we can kind of answer not only what will happen in the ocean, but maybe also what will happen in this feedback back into the atmosphere. So I'm interested in these kind of large scale questions, even though I'm studying such small organisms. So my work looks at warming. Um, we'll forget about the carbon dioxide for now. And the effects of warming are pretty well studied. Um, so if you think about biology, think about the classic um, bacterial growth curve. You can remember that the uh, growth rates tend to increase with warming and then suddenly reach a point where it becomes detrimental and then they'll kind of die off really quickly. So this has been well studied, but um, the effects of warming are going to depend a lot on things like the species. So every species has a different thermal tolerance, the community that that species is existing and functioning within, and also the physical environment. So for example, whether you're looking at a coastal or an open ocean environment, those are gonna have different uh, physical dynamics that are gonna affect the species and et cetera, the list kind of goes on. Warming also affects the physical environment in a bunch of different ways, but for the purpose of this talk, since I'm looking at nutrient limitation, um, one important way that it's going to in uh, influence the physical environment is, is by this process called thermal stratification. So if you think back to like less to like density lessons, um, less dense things float on top of more dense things. So this is kind of that basic idea of stratification. So if you increase the temperature of that upper layer of the ocean, this is actually a picture of a lake, but it, the same concept applies. If you increase the temperature, it's going to get less dense, and this is going to increase the density gradient between the upper layer and the layers below. And this almost creates a physical barrier, not exactly physical, obviously, but it re really restricts circulation to within that upper layer. And this is important because new nutrients are generally a lot of times brought up from below at depth. So by restricting circulation and decreasing circulation, we're actually gonna see potentially an increase in nutrient limitation and thus restricting growth of the phytoplankton in the upper layer of the ocean. Okay, so again, we kind of know what happens when we mess around with temperature. This is temperature and growth rate, excuse the lack of units here. And this is um, concentration of iron, just another important nutrient and growth rate. 
So we kind of know what happens um, here, but what happens when we kind of combine them? And there's potentially interactive effects, possibly. There has been some research that shows that these two stressors, when applied at the same time, can have effects that you wouldn't be able to predict by just adding them or studying them in isolation. So by studying them together, we can get more of a realistic uh, idea of what's going to happen in the ocean. Okay, lots of background. So now we're getting into what I worked on this summer. So here's my research question. What are the effects of simultaneous warming and nutrient limitation on communities off the coast of Catalina? And some hypotheses I came up with were that warming might help cells deal with nutrient limitations. So this is coming from that previous research that I just referred to where they found for iron, which is an essential micronutrient, and for cyanobacteria, they warming actually kind of helps the cells do better under nutrient limitation. And the thought possibly is that it increased their metabolic efficiency. So they kind of were like processing these nutrients more quickly and using them more efficiently. But whether that applies in this situation, we don't know. And then also looking or thinking about the community composition um, of these communities, I thought maybe once we increase temperature and decrease nutrients, that the composition might shift from larger cell diatoms, which are really prevalent out here, um, towards smaller cells that are more equipped to deal with um, warm, warmer temperatures and lower nutrients because um, they have a smaller like surface area to volume ratio. So yeah, those are my hypotheses. And then this is the general workflow um, in some images that I took over the summer. So um, starting out by collecting water, I just went out in a boat and used a bilge pump to pump water into these carboys. And then I just brought them straight back to lab and started my experiment. So before I started this, I did what we call T0 sampling, and that stands for like time point zero. And that gives me a baseline idea of what that initial community just out in the ocean off the coast of Catalina is like, and that'll allow me to compare the end of my experiment results to the initial um, community. Then I was starting my experiment, so I added uh, different nutrients, which I'll show on the next slide, and then I incubated them at different temperatures, and then once they were kind of well acclimated to these conditions, I did final sampling and collected my final data. So this is a really general for, uh, kind of idea of the temperature and nutrient conditions I had this summer. So I had two nutrient treatments, um, replete, which means that we added all the nutrients that they could ever need. Um, and then in this case, decided to limit them for silica, which just means I added no silica to the treatments. And the reason I that we kind of chose silica um, is because we thought it would have the like, most profound effect on the communities out here, which um, again, silica is going to um, influence the diatoms because they need silica. So those are a really prevalent part of the community. So by manipulating that, we kind of get these differences in community structure. And then three temperatures, I have 20, which is kind of the ambient natural conditions out here. 25 and 30 are my two warmer temperatures. And I had three replicates of each let those incubate for a while, and then I did my sampling. So just as a general idea of what I'm talking about when I say sampling, here's some data that I collect. So physiological and molecular uh, data. So for physiological, I have things like carbon fixation rates. So how uh, much carbon are they fixing? How much are they photosynthesizing? And then carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, silica, and chlorophyll A content, and how do, how do those change between treatments? And then samples for microscopy and flow cytometry to get an idea of the different members of the community. And from those, I can then calculate things like growth rates, elemental use efficiencies, and elemental ratios. And those are all really important concepts in oceanography. And then for molecular, I just collect samples for DNA, which I'm looking forward to analyzing and seeing how actually more accurately the community structure is changing. And these are just images of some of my filtered samples. I think this one was from 
my uh, T0 sampling. And then this one is from after I performed all my, uh, or I, after I carried out the experiments, you can see how much more uh, cells there are there. So I'll just show a couple of results um, from my initial experiment earlier in the summer. So these are just carbon-based growth rates, and this is for the total community. And what I thought was possibly interesting here is that, well, first of all, replete over here and limited over here. And then I have my three temperatures, and this is just their growth rates, relative growth rates. So what I thought was interesting is that in the replete uh, treatments, we see this kind of decrease in growth rates and maybe 20 and 25 are pretty similar, but 30 is definitely a decreased growth rate compared to these two. But we see this opposite trend going on with the limited communities where the uh, cooler temperatures are lower in growth rate. And then for some reason, 30 really increased its growth rate. So I thought that was kind of curious. And I thought maybe these elemental use efficiencies could <clears throat> help explain this because I see the same trends. Let me explain what elemental use efficiencies are first. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm actually meant to uh, better label these. So PUE means phosphorus use efficiency and NUE means nitrogen use efficiency. So these are just two important nutrients that we're looking at. Um, and it just means how efficiently they're using the, those nutrients or specifically how much carbon can they fix with that given amount of nutrient, because you can see the units here are moles of carbon per hour fixed per the mole of nitrogen, per moles of nitrogen that they have. So really it's just how efficiently they're using the nutrients. But again, we see this decrease between the, these cooler temperatures to the warmest temperature and replete again here. And for limited, we kind of see that they're increasing their use efficiencies. So maybe that, because it's following that similar trend, maybe that could be why. Maybe at the warmer temperature, they are using these nutrients more efficiently, which is allowing them to grow more. But again, this is only for the whole community. And I do have more samples to start analyzing, which might tell us more about what different groups or different, at least different size fractions of the community are doing to kind of better understand what's actually going on here. So those are some really quick results and I'll finish with some conclusions and next steps. So I'm basically reiterating what I just said, but the nutrient limited communities were better. It seemed to be better at growing at the warmest temperature over here than the nutrient replete, which actually even grew slower than the limited at that temperature, at that warmest temperature. So maybe it's due to differences in the community structure. So I thought, what makes sense is in the replete where we're giving them all the silica, they would be more diatom dominated, whereas in the limited, there might be fewer diatoms, they might be more cyanobacteria or smaller algae dominated, which are classically better at growing at warmer temperatures and under limited conditions. So maybe that's what's happening. Maybe that's why there's this difference in growth rate. Again, maybe those elemental use efficiencies could help explain some of these differences. So maybe at the warmest temperature, they're using these nutrients more efficiently. And then just thinking about maybe what could some implications for climate change be based on just these basic results. But in the future, if we have, say, this combination of bloom conditions, and bloom conditions just means um, conditions for an algae bloom, which just means nutrient input. Um, so maybe there's more, if there's a lot of nutrients and there's warming from climate change, we might see this decrease in growth, which we see here. But if there's maybe nutrient limited conditions, maybe due to climate change, like I was talking about the stratification, or maybe due to just sometimes nutrients um, decrease throughout the year, for example, or throughout the summer, plus warming from climate change, that would be like this condition, maybe we would see increased growth. But that's just kind of thinking ahead and I'm excited to see more of these results and how, um, how they might paint a bit better picture of what's going on. And yeah, I'm excited to look at those DNA um, results and actually investigate how the community composition may differ between these treatments. 
because I think that could be a really interesting part of this whole story. And yeah, so thank you so much. I'm actually leaving Wrigley today. Um, so this is a perfect time to do this talk. Um, it was really incredible opportunity and definitely would not have been able to do this kind of work without these facilities. So thank you to everyone who made this possible. And if you have questions um, or comments or any follow-up, anything, um, feel free to email me. Here's my email. And yeah, thank you so much for listening.